Good morning, Central family. My name is Maggie Padgett, and here's an update on all things Central. Crochet Coffee and Conversation is expanding. There has been so much interest in this group that we will now offer it twice a month. This month, the group will meet this Monday, March 13th, and again on Monday, March 27th, on the Family Life Center third floor. We hope to see you right here at Central. Starting this Wednesday, March 15th, we will offer God of Deliverance by Jen Wilkin from 6 to 7.30 p.m. in room 2222 in the Family Life Center. Join us if you want to learn about the deeper theological implications of stories you've known for years. Understand how God protects His children and prioritizes their worship of Him above all else. And explore how God provided deliverance for His children to be able to worship Him freely and how it affects our lives today. Please visit cbcdouglasville.com slash Jen Wilkin Wednesday for more information and registration. Giving is the cornerstone of all we do here at Central. If you feel led to give, please visit our lobby kiosks or give at cbcdouglasville.com slash give. Your gift gives us the opportunity to serve our community and minister to the ends of the earth. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the service. Just um, as we start this morning, I want to say hello to a couple of very special people to us. We have, um, we have some guests with us right over here that are um, very, very good friends and partners with Nick. And so we're so glad that they're here with us this morning. Y'all just tell them hello. All right, stand with us. Let's worship together. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn, our sins they are many, His mercy is more. Aren't you glad this morning? What love, what love could remember the wrongs we and all knowing he counts not their sum thrown into a sea without bottom or shore our sins they are many his mercy is more praise the Lord his mercy is more stronger than darkness new every morn our sins they are What patience, what patience would wait as we constantly grow, what father so tender is calling us home, he welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor, our sins they are many, his mercy is more, praise the Lord, his mercy is more.
Amen? Yeah. Wally, come on up. Good morning, and welcome to Central. It's a pleasure to have you worshiping with us here in person and online as well. My name is Wally Bryce, and I'm the executive pastor here at Central. And if you have questions or anything about your time here today, check with us in the information area, and we'll be super happy to help with that. You'll also notice if you're new here with us that there's a Connect card in the uh, back of the pew. You can complete those the old-fashioned way on this card, or you can do that by text or by scanning a QR code. So lots of ways to uh, give us your information so that we can let you know what's going on here at Central all the time. So we'd love to be able to connect with you in that way. There are two things that you can do while you're here today. You don't even have to remember it for another week or anything. There's a Sanibel Island Mission Trip meeting today in front of the piano just after the service. So if you have questions about that trip or you'd like to go ahead and register to go, you can take care of all that today. And we'll start about five minutes after the service is over, just right in front of the piano. That trip takes place April 1st through the 7th, and we'll be doing hurricane recovery in the Fort Myers and Sanibel Island area. So there'll be plenty to do. You don't have to worry about being bored at all because we'll have a lot of work to do and a lot of folks to minister with there. The second thing is today starts the 21 days of prayer and fasting, and uh, Matt will be uh, speaking to that when he comes up as well. But we have the... Uh, devotions and prayer guides in the uh, information area in the back, but also uh, many of you, uh, all of you actually should have received an email with that guide electronically, and you can go to the website and uh, see that as well. So if you prefer to do that electronically, you have that option, but we have some paper copies in the back as well. But I'm looking forward to see what God does with us uh, during this time where we set aside and pray corporately for the same things and this emphasis. Uh, lastly, uh, we do talk about giving here on a weekly basis because it's part of our worship experience here. And uh, we can, uh, we can uh, do that in several different ways. We have the uh, drop boxes in the back that you can drop your gift weekly. Or you can uh, go online to cbcdouglasville.com slash giving and take care of that uh, online as well. And we even take them if you mail them in the old mailbox. So we're good with that too. But, but uh, anyway, there's information about giving in the back as well. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this day. And Lord, we just pray that uh, we'll open our minds and our hearts to the message you have for us today through song and through preaching. And Lord... Uh, change us while we're here that we will make a big difference for you uh, when we leave this place as well Lord pray for the uh, singers and for Matt and uh, just give them the words to say and things to do that we need today your name we pray amen thank you Wally I'll tell you what I think we need to do this morning before we sing anymore I think you need to get up think you need to walk over to somebody and say, it feels an hour earlier than it is. <laughs> All right. Hop up and say hello to somebody this morning. You may kind of work your way back to your seats and go ahead and be seated for right now, all right? Worship with us, though.
Thank you. 
Week three of our series in Jonah, Matters of the Heart, one would expect, and I expected to begin chapter two today, um, but we're actually going to stay in chapter one for one more week, so uh, I, I believe God's got something special for us this morning uh, in Jonah chapter one. We're going to specifically look at verses seven to 17, um, but we're looking at the life of the prophet Jonah, who was, let's just be honest, by all accounts, the absolute worst. This guy is the worst. Can we just, uh, we can say that, and we can say that of all of the prophets we read about in the Bible, Jonah is at the bottom of the list. Um, by, uh, it, this man is a cautionary tale of what it looks like to run from God. We read the book of Jonah, uh, we read the account of Jonah, and we walk away saying, this was a guy who hated other people so much that he wouldn't go because he knew that they would probably repent. Now, I want you to look at the last verse in the book of Jonah. Look at the last book, look at the last verse in this short book. It says, how many people? There's a number there. How many people do you read? 120,000 people who could not tell their right from their left hand in Nineveh. And most Bible scholars actually think this refers to the number of children who were in the city of Nineveh. How heartless must you be to refuse to go and share the good news about a God in heaven who loves you when there are 120 thousand children in a city. Jonah, while he was incredibly religious, was by all accounts a graceless racist who didn't want his enemies to experience the grace and forgiveness of God. So his actions certainly did not speak to the calling on his life as a prophet of God. So if you understand Jonah's struggle, you understand this book. Now, now why does that matter, understanding Jonah's struggle? Well, I, I, I for one, I'm so grateful for the book of Jonah. We're going to talk about this again at the end. This was sort of, we're sort of bookending this message um, together. I'm so grateful for the book of Jonah because the book of Jonah is an Old Testament book that is a perfect picture of the New Testament gospel. And if you get the book of Jonah, you get the gospel. You understand the gospel of Jesus. So what was Jonah's struggle? At the end of the day, if you were given an assignment after this series to write a short paper and say, this was the message of Jonah. This was what Jonah struggled with more than anything else. Here's his struggle. Jonah struggled to understand how a God How God in heaven could be righteous, perfect, and holy, and also merciful. How can righteousness, judgment against sin, and mercy coexist at the same time? time. How can a God who cannot look upon sin, who is forced to deal with sin, uh, how can he be merciful towards people who are constantly doing evil things? Holy God must deal with sin, right? I mean, have you not found that to be true in your life? Have you not found that to be true? Those of us who have been in church for a long, long time, we've studied the Bible maybe for a long, long time, we understand that God does not take sin lightly, does he? God is going to deal with sin. How then can a holy God be merciful towards people who constantly and consistently do evil? So with everything in Jonah, he is calling out for justice against these people from Nineveh, the natural enemies of Israel. Someone has to pay for the wrong that they've done. Someone has to pay for all the atrocities that they've committed, the evil, the crimes that they've perpetuated against our people. But what Jonah, as short-sighted as he was, couldn't understand was that someday, hundreds of years after Jonah, someone would pay for the crimes of Nineveh. That's the beautiful story of Jonah. That while Jonah is calling out for justice against Nineveh, God is saying, just wait. Just wait. There is going to be justice. Someone will pay for the crimes and the sins of 
Nineveh. Someone would come. A better prophet, a good prophet would come. The Son of God would come, and that prophet, the Son of God himself, would because he is righteous and requires justice, would allow his own son to pay the price for the sins of Nineveh, the sins of Jonah, the sins of you and I. It is only the cross of King Jesus where we see justice and mercy perfectly married together, dealing with sin while being merciful towards sinners. So if you understand Jonah, you have a deeper love and appreciation for who Jesus is and for what Jesus has done. The answer for Jonah's struggle of how God could be both justice and mercy is Jesus. What a beautiful truth for us this morning. And that's a picture that you and I need before us always. We need a clear picture of the gospel in front of us because every one of us, every single one of us in this room has a tendency. We tend towards either righteousness and judgment. A lot of this is just the way you're wired up, how your personality is. Some of us in the room, we tend towards uh, righteousness and judgment. We want to see wrong things made right. We want to make sure that things are, what? Fair. We want to make sure that there's fairness. You think about when you were a child, and you think about someone cutting a sandwich in half, a person that tends towards righteousness and justice, what are they going to do with the two halves of the sandwich? They're going to do what? I mean, they're going to hold them, they're going to lay one down on top of the other. I want to make sure that this is fair because if it's not fair, it's not, it, I mean, this is an issue. They got a bigger piece. The birthday cake, it's being cut, right? But they got a bigger piece, right? Always looking to make sure things are fair and just, okay? So our tendency, this is why this can be a problem. This is a good thing that the Lord has put in us. But the tendency towards justice can warp our hearts when we desire justice so much that we resent mercy. And some of it, we've, we've experienced this. This is not news to us. This is, this is an old hat, just maybe being said a different way. When we desire justice so much that we resent mercy, then our desire for justice has warped our heart. We've become self-righteous and trust in our own selves instead of Christ alone for grace and salvation. All right, so we, we, we see that. All right, the problem with that is that our God is a God of mercy, is he not? And our, I mean, every single one of us in here are grateful for the mercy of God for ourselves, at least, right? And sometimes we, we resent it towards other people. How can they get away with all that they've done? Right? That, that's the justice side of us speaking, okay? In, in, in fact, the problem with, with that, of course, God is the God of justice, and Jesus, his own brother, uh, James says in his letter that mercy, do you remember, triumphs over what? Over judgment. That is the message of the cross, that God is going to judge sin, but his mercy is going to triumph over judgment for all those who believe and put their faith and trust in Jesus. There are others of us in this room that we tend not towards justice and righteousness as much, but we tend towards grace and mercy. It's just in the way that the Lord has wired us up, our, our hearts are so soft towards, towards pain. We love mercy. We lean into mercy and forgiveness, and we want everybody to experience mercy as we have and as we should. But there's a tendency there as well, that the tendency for mercy lovers sometimes, oftentimes, is to forget about sin and righteousness. Right? It, it, it's to sometimes we can actually ignore Sin and evil and righteousness. Praise God for Jesus. Because it is the cross that fully embraces and teaches us about the righteousness of God and the mercy of God. So that I don't believe we live in the tension between um, grace, mercy, and righteousness. Jesus wasn't pulled between the two. Jesus fully embraced both. 
We follow a God, love a God, and our God, our God is a king who fully embraces both his mercy and his righteous and justice. It is a picture we need before us always, and it reminds us of a couple of things that we see in Jonah chapter 1. The first being this, when we sin, we find consequence. When we sin, we always find consequence. Now, when we, many times we think we get away with something. How many of you as a child thought you got away with something? Do you remember anything specific that you thought you got away with, but only later you were busted for it? I got, I got busted for everything as a kid. Like, I didn't, you can ask my mom. I didn't get away with anything, right? I mean, what a gift that ended up being. But every time I thought I got away with something, mom or dad would always find out. Meanwhile, my older brother seemed to get away with everything, I don't know if they just wised up by the time I came along and they'd seen all the tricks by then, but I, I, I never actually got away with many things. Um, and, but many times we think that we get away with something because no one saw it, um, no one caught it, no one busted me, but the reality is not one person has ever truly ever gotten away with anything. There's no sin that one of us have ever really fully, we, we might have snuck it past our parents. Right, we, we might have turned in a paper that we didn't fully author. Our teacher might not have found out. We might have fudged some numbers on our taxes. The IRS may not have busted us yet. Yet. Why do you guys sound so nervous? But what we're saying is that no one has gotten away with anything because he knows our Father in Heaven sees Galatians 6, 7, and 8 says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. So I point out just a couple of things that are consequences of sin. The first one is physical. Sometimes we can actually suffer physical consequences from sin. We're not saying that every physical malady we have is because of our sin or somebody else's sin. It's not what we're saying at all. Jesus is very clear on that. But what we are saying is that sometimes a consequence for our sin, our sinful habits, attitudes, actions, can be physical. Um, you decide to rob a bank, you can suffer a physical consequence. If you get caught, there is going to be a physical consequence. Okay? Uh, uh, sinful choices, right? And we're not... I don't know if we got any bank robbers in the room. I hope not. But sinful choices, sinful attitudes, sinful habits can rob us of peace, can rob your body of good restful sleep, can curse you with unusually high stress and anxiety. These are what sinful patterns can do in our life. And so sometimes we can experience physical consequences from our sin. There are also emotional consequences for our sin. Uh, Psalm 51, 12, David writes, Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Uphold me with a willing spirit. Having sinned against God, David was desperate for restoration because he sensed this, uh, this separation, this wall between he and his heavenly Father. It's astounding how foolish we are. So, so many times we give in to temptation and sin, because we, we believe that our choice is actually going to... You've seen this. When people give in to a sin... And let's, let's, use, let's use a specific example. We live in the age of social media. And there are many who have cheated on a spouse and had an extramarital affair because they reconnected with somebody on social media from years gone by. And the devil comes along at, at a moment when somebody is feeling weak or maybe neglected or what have you, and they begin to fall for the lie that if I begin this relationship or pick this relationship up again, I am going to be fulfilled emotionally. Somebody's going to fill up some things that I feel like I've been lacking in my life. But how foolish is this? Because sin re wrecks us emotionally. Well, the devil is such a liar that he tempts us with a thing that we feel like is going to satisfy a craving within us. But what, what, what happens is when we give in to that very thing, it destroys us. It crushes us emotionally. Listen to David in Psalm 32, 3 and 4. He said, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away. Like I, I just... 
David could feel himself just rotting away on the inside. Through my groaning all day long for day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of the summer. The consequences for sin are almost always felt emotionally. You know the most exhausting thing that a Christian can do? I want you to think about this. I want you to see this. The most exhausting thing that you will ever attempt is to try and live the Christian life in the power of your own flesh. And I, I, if we could just close our eyes, I'm not going to ask you to do this, but if we closed our eyes and we raised our hands to say, how many of us have actually experienced that? Here's what we'd find. Every single one of us in this room would put our hand up. And say, I've tried to live the Christian life. I've tried to be a good little follower of Jesus in my own flesh and in my own strength. And it is absolutely exhausting. The consequences of sin are emotional and will leave us wrecked and feeling like we're wasting away inside. The third consequence of sin is always spiritual. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God, praise him, is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. 1 John 3, 6, no one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. 1 John 3, 19 to 22, by this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and he knows everything. Beloved, he says, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. Prophet Isaiah 59 two, but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Paul teaches us that sin ultimately leads to separation from God, which is a spiritual consequence and ultimately will lead to an eternal and physical consequence of separation from God. John teaches us that continual, habitual sins means we're already separated from God. And so the sin itself, in a way, becomes its own consequence. Jesus says that we are branches, and he is what? He is a vine. And for the branch to be nourished and produce fruit, it must find abiding in the vine. And when we live in sin, we are removed from the vine. And so sin becomes its own consequence upon our lives, that spiritually we're suffering, this, the, the, these consequences separ- of, of feeling separated from our Heavenly Father. So i got to ask, do you, are, are there any of us that feel that this morning? Are there any of us that feel like a dried, withered up branch this morning? that's been separated from the nourishment of the true vine. And if there are, are there parts of your life that you've kept back from your heavenly Father? Are are there parts of your story, are there parts that you've not opened up to Him that call out for confession and repentance? There's a relational cost to sin as well. There's a relational cost, not only a spiritual, not only a physical, not only emotional, but there's a relational cost to sin. Look at verse 5 of Jonah chapter 1. Let's look at these verses together. It says, Then the mariners were afraid. This is while the storm is raging all around them on the Mediterranean. And he each cried out to his God. And they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and then laid down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Maybe the God will give us a thought to us that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell to Jonah. And they said to him, Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? It's not only Jonah who is paying the price for his sin here. We see that. We understand that. The sailors on this boat are paying a significant cost to what Jonah had done wrong. These sailors were deeply affected by Jonah's disobedience. Jonah ran from God. And God sends a storm after Jonah. But Jonah's not alone in the boat. As the storm rages all around them. 
These guys, these mariners who are transporting goods for a living, had to throw their cargo overboard. Right? The means that they had for providing for their family, they are throwing into the ocean. They are paying a steep price for the sin of someone else. Jonah's sin cost them dearly. See, our sin is not only about us. Our sin can be done in private, but it almost always will cost us relationally. I was 21 years old in running from the Lord when I came face to face with this reality that my sin affected me, but my sin also affected all those who loved me. When you live in sin, you wreck the lives of those who care most about you. It affects affects the body of Christ. affects your family. As a parent, it affects your children. It affects your, affects your spouse. It affects those around us. There's a relational consequence for the sin in our lives. And when we sin, we always pay a consequence, but God loves us so much that he will go to incredible lengths like he did with Jonah to get our attention to draw us back into a right relationship with him. But, but do you know what he wants? He, he wants us not just to be sorrowful over the consequences of our sin. Right? And as a parent, I understand, I don't, I don't want my kids just to fear the consequence. Like, I'm going to take that away if you continue to do that. Like, that was wrong. I'm calling you out on that. I'm disciplining you. But we want to get to the point where we actually have regret and, and we, we're sorrowful and have disgust over the attitudes and the actions that we took in the first place. This is what God wants for us. He's looking for repentance. And repentance means that we, through the grace of God, become disgusted with our own sin. So when we sin, there's a consequence. Second, when we run, we never find our intended destination. When we run, we never find our destination. Jonah 1.9 he said to them, I am a Hebrew. I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. It's really interesting that the, these sailors, notice this, these sailors asked him a question. They asked him a series of questions. Who are you? Where are you from? What do you do for a living? Who, who's your God? Do you pick, have you picked up on which question he never answered? What did he not, what did he not say? I am what? I'm a prophet. Why do you think that is? I think it's because Jonah feel like he gave away his calling when he ran from the Lord. I think Jonah feels like he is no longer a prophet of God. I'm still a Hebrew. I still serve the one true God who made the seas and the heavens and everything else. But I'm no longer fit to be called the prophet of God. When we, when we run, you find it never reach our intended destination. I'm a Hebrew. I fear the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. Look at, listen to these verses. See what this sounds like. Luke chapter 15, 18 and 19. A young man said, I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against you. I have sinned against heaven and before you I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. It's amazing that Jonah ran from God, but he, he never actually reached his destination. Jonah was trying to get to Tarshish, but he ended up in Nineveh. Right? You, you can run all you want, but you will never get where you are intending on your own to go. Notice this. Look back at verse 3. Look back at verse 3 in chapter 1. Verse 3 in chapter 1 says that Jonah went down to Joppa, found a ship, and he paid what? He paid the fare. Here's what I've found in my life. If you run from God, you will always pay, but you will never get where you intend to go. It'll always cost. But I'll never get where I intended to go on my own. It'll always cost you. It'll always cost dearly. Students, I want you to hear me this morning. It, 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 God is calling you. I know in our teenagers, our middle schoolers, high schoolers, college students, you're, you're, at an eight, you're at a time in your life where you are wrestling with, what am I going to do with the rest of my days on this earth? We're, we're talking vocation. But I want you to understand there is a calling much more primary than vocation. 
God calls you to himself. God, call, before he calls you to a skill, before he calls you to education, before he calls you to a ministry, before he calls you to some other commitment, he calls, he calls us to himself. And if you run from him, it will cost you every single time. It will cost you every single time. I, I look back on my life, and I've heard people say, all my days I've heard people say, people around me, celebrities, you'll hear people, you'll hear all sorts of people make a statement like this. They'll say, you know, I went through some stuff, but I wouldn't change a thing because it got me to where I am. You've heard that? Maybe you've said that? I've probably been guilty of saying that, um, but I can't say that. Looking at you now as a 43-year-old man, there are so many things in my life that I would absolutely go back and change in a heartbeat had I the opportunity. I would change so much because I regret so much of my years running from the Lord. I regret how I influenced and led and encouraged other people who were running right alongside of me. It's almost like for a season in my life, when I was playing the part of Jonah, I was on a race to hell, and I was running alongside of other people, doing what any good runner does in a race. I'm encouraging the people next to me. It's just our destination was the wrong one. Just cheering them along with the way I live my life. I have so many regrets. There's so much that I would go back and I would do differently and look at a younger version of myself and say, no, it is not worth it. You won't get where you're intending to go. You will pay heavy consequences. But by the grace of God, he'll pull you out of it. So don't waste your time. Don't waste your time going to Tarshish. Don't waste your time like the prodigal son running off into a far, far away country. You won't get there. You'll be like the son who ran from the father and spent it all. But where did it get him? Except for on all fours eating with pigs, thinking if I could only go back to my dad, I'd just be happy to be a servant in the house. He left home to be the big man, to make a name for himself. But he comes back with a limp, wishing to be treated like a hired hand. See, the issue for so many of us as believers is this. We are, we are dignified to the degree that we will run from God's call on our life, but we're not necessarily running to Tarshish. We're not necessarily running to the far country the way the prodigal son was. We may run away from the specific call of God. We may run from the call of God to go to our neighbor. We may run from the call of God to go address the problems of our community or our city. We may run from the culture that we're surrounded by. But when God calls us to go and we say no, we find ourselves just as disobedient as Jonah. Just as disobedient as Jonah. You've heard it said before that Jesus is either Lord of all in my life or he's not Lord at all in my life. Jesus, Jesus is either Lord of all of my decisions or he's not really Lord of any of my decisions. When we run, we never find our intended destination. But when we turn, we always find mercy. Look at verse 17. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Wow. I mean, that doesn't at first look like mercy, but what mercy that is. First of all, because they threw him into the ocean in a storm. And he's going to drown if the fish doesn't come along when it does. There's great mercy there. Number two, Jonah has assumed that he has, he has given up the calling of God on his life, and God is even showing him by a great fish, swallowing him, that I am not done with you. What a merciful God, that he is not discounted from future ministry. So there are two things that I want to show you right here as we turn back to God and we always find mercy. The first one is this, that Jonah points to us. Jonah points to us. Jonah's one of the greatest books in the Bible for me because I, I, I get it. I, I get Jonah. I understand him. I read Jonah and I do not say, well, how could you? I look at Jonah and I say, what a bum. What a bad prophet. But I don't look at, I'm not confused when I read Jonah. I, 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 I read Jonah and I say, 
Me too. I, I, I'm right there with you. I understand Jonah. He's the worst. He's terrible. I, but I, I read Jonah and I see myself in Jonah. I see Jonah in me. I, I read Moses and Joshua and I see the faithfulness of God and I say, amazing, wow. Look what, look what God did through them. I read David and I, and I say, wow, I can't, I can't imagine the exploits and the, the giants and the, the, uh, all of the things, the Psalms. I, wow, amazing. I read Paul and I, I marvel at his intellect and, and the heart of a missionary planting churches and taking the gospel into places where the gospel had not gone. I read John and I, I, I see intimacy. The pastoral heart of, I would say, a good man. I read Jonah and I see me. I see reluctance and disobedience. I see the spirit of a man who thinks he knows better than his God. I see Jonah and I see myself. I see so many Christians where we, we think we know better than God. Jonah points to us like a mirror, and I see myself on every page and every crooked decision, and my heart breaks as I come face to face with my own selfishness, my own bias against my perceived enemies, my own reluctance to fully follow when his plans interrupt my plans. I read Jonah, and it could just as easily be about me, but Jonah also points to Jesus. This is the best part of the story of Jonah. Jonah is such a pale reflection of Jesus, but, 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 but God in his graciousness shows us something in Jonah. How? First, both Jonah and Jesus gave their lives to save sinners. Jesus laid down his life to rescue us. You know, it's interesting in the Old Testament, water represents chaos that separates us from God. And what a picture of Jesus as Jonah is thrown into the sea, into the chaos to silence the storm that was taking this boat down. Uh, Jonah knew that his death would save their lives, even if only temporarily. Irony of ironies. That, that Jonah's running from God will save those sinful Ninevites and actually lead to the salvation of even more Gentiles. The sailors he ho who hoped would help him Escape from God. The New Testament picks up on Jonah as a type of Christ who illustrates Jesus going down and being swallowed by death before being raised up to life, demonstrating victory over the chaos that separates man from, from, from God. Of course, the, the death Jesus faced was more than just metaphorical. In Nineveh, someday God will... Absolutely overthrow Nineveh and all the great kingdoms of the world. But what does the Bible say? Someday, but that today is the day of salvation. For those from Nineveh, for those from Douglasville, from those from your home, and from my home. This world is full of Nineveh, and although God someday will overthrow it and judge it, for all those who hear the voice of Jesus and repent and turn to him in faith, there is mercy yet for each and every one. Praise God for Jesus, the greater Jonah. We could do this all day long, the comparisons between Jonah and Jesus, but there's one final connection comparing Jesus in Mark chapter 4 uh, with Jonah. Jesus is the God-man. I read this week that the sailors throw Jonah in the water for fear of the storm, but here's a startling detail that many have missed. When the storm ceased, the sailors got really, really scared. Do you remember this? Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. In the Greek version of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, the construct for this fear is essentially, this is what it says. This is, I mean, this is why it's not translated this way in our, our copies of the Bible, because the construct, the grammatical construct is mega scared squared, like a whole bunch of fear on top of fear. Mega scared squared. That phrase is almost used exclusively, exclusively in the Greek language to describe a theophany when people engage with God in the Old Testament. Okay, interestingly enough, Mark's Gospel chapter 4 um, is... As many of us know, studied the New Testament, Mark, his primary uh, means of writing, his primary interviewer, 
is Peter. So many stories about Peter and Peter's understanding um, in, in, in Mark. And you can hardly read Mark chapter 4 without feeling the impulse from Peter, a fisherman who spent time out on the lake with Jesus, to go back to Jonah chapter 1 and 2. And I think Mark and Peter would want us to think this way. In Mark chapter 4, Jesus simply awakens from his sleep to join the disciples who are fearful of a great storm. Jesus wakes up and calms the storm, and he says, peace, be still. And and the the striking similarity between the response of the sailors on Jonah's boat and the response of the sailors on Jesus' boat. Mark chapter 4, verse 41, the disciples were filled with what? Do you remember? Great fear. It's the exact same wording we find in Jonah chapter 2, verse 16. Mega, scared, squared. Whole bunch of fear on top of fear. Fear times fear. And Jonah's sailors marvel at the power of Yahweh when the storm ceases, and Jesus' disciples marvel at the power of Yahweh in Jesus, asking this question, who is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? The answer, the God-man. Who will calm a greater chaos when he willingly submits and allows himself to be nailed to a cross on our behalf? In other words, the man Jesus is God himself. And Jesus did perfectly, did perfectly what Jonah also accomplished only temporarily. Both were from Galilee. We talked about that in week one. Jonah struggled with his call to preach while Jesus struggled to do the will of his father in the desert and in Gethsemane. Both preach God's message of judgment and reconciliation to the marginalized and to sinners. Both chose death forsaken by others. Both bore and removed the consequences of sin from others. Both caused the storm to cease after sleeping through it. Jonah entered the jaws of a fish. Jesus entered the jaws of a grave. Both were kept for three days. Both were raised up again by the Father. Jonah's obedience in preaching led to the conversion of a great city. Jesus' obedience led to the conversion of all who would believe and put their faith and trust in him. There is mercy when we turn. There is mercy for everyone who will turn from their sin and turn to Jesus. So stop running if you're in the room and you're running. If you're listening online or watching online, if you're running from God, stop running and submit to this gracious Savior who can calm the chaos in your life with a word. With a word. I'm going to ask us to bow our heads and close our eyes. The invitation is twofold this morning. As you should be aware, as Wally mentioned earlier today, we begin as a church family, 21 days of collective prayer and fasting. Resources went out to you this week. You can also pick those up in the lobby. And we end that on Palm Sunday, the week before Easter. And so at any time during this invitation, If you feel led to come and begin to pray, I'm going to ask many of us just to gather at the altar and begin to pray. And here's what I'm going to ask us to pray. As we we finish up chapter 1 of Jonah, here's what's striking to me. The mercy of God, more than anything else, is so striking to me. And that there is yet time for those we know who don't know Jesus, who in the past have rejected him. Or maybe you have, maybe there's some of us in the room that we have children that walked with God and are not walking with God. Could I just say to you this morning, there is mercy for your kids when they turn to Jesus. Some of us, I, I believe the Lord is just waiting for us just to begin to pray bold prayers for them to return to Christ. So this morning, The invitation is simple. Come and pray for your kids. Come and pray for your neighbors. Some of us in the room may have a spouse that doesn't know or love Jesus. And you have been praying. Keep on praying. Keep on seeking. When they stop running, there's yet mercy for them. So in a moment, 21 days. And I'm just going to ask everybody in the room, even right now, even right now, 
over the next 21 days, would you ask the Lord to give you a name? Would you ask the Lord to give you a name of somebody you know in your family, someone you work with, someone that, 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 that you just, you've seen out in the community, but you know they need Jesus. And for 21 days, will you bring their name before the Father starting today, asking God, oh God, will you yet be merciful to them? Will you give me opportunity over the next three weeks to share the love of Jesus with this person? Let's bring them to the Father. But there are some of us in the room this morning. And maybe, just maybe, there's a very specific area in your life where you know you have been running from God and there's an area in your life where you feel dried and withered up and you know the Holy Spirit has said to you, There may be an obedience issue. Could I just encourage you as well? Today is the day of salvation for you. To be delivered from disobedience. To follow in full obedience. He's either Lord of all in my life. Or he's not Lord at all. And if that's the case for you, then in a moment we're going to stand and sing while people are going to gather at the altar and pray. And if you need to pray with someone, Brother Charles will be standing down front. I'll be standing down front. And we would love to pray with you about that. Be obedient to what the Holy Spirit is doing in your life. Listen to him. He is so gracious and merciful towards you. If you need to meet this Jesus that we've spent so much time this morning talking about, the great joy of our lives is to introduce people to Jesus, and we would love to do that. There are other things that you need to do to be obedient, whether it's, you know what, my my step of obedience is I need to be baptized. I need to join this church. Would you please come forward? Just let us know. We'll celebrate with you and counsel you on what the next appropriate steps are. Our only concern this morning is helping you take your next step in obedience to our merciful and loving Father. So I'm going to pray. I'm going to say amen. If you feel called to come and pray for someone, then please do so. If you feel called to come forward and have Brother Charles or myself pray with you, please come do so. When we stand, you be obedient to whatever God has put on your heart. Heavenly Father, it is in the name of the merciful Jesus we pray. Who because of your righteousness, because of your demand for justice, went to the cross on my behalf went to the cross taking, bearing sin, becoming sin on our behalf, that in you we might become the righteousness, the very righteousness of God. So, Father, help us to be obedient to what you've put on our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We stand as we sing, come, pray. Pray with us if you feel led to.
Let's start that from the beginning, okay? Hey, a couple of things. Go ahead and have a seat uh, because we do have some really, really wonderful, cool announcements to share with you um, this morning. Um, recently, the Pinnock family have joined us here at Central. So give everybody a wave. Pinnock family right down here. So had the opportunity to sit down with them um, on Wednesday night and talk about church membership, and they are already diving in uh, with both feet. And so come by after the service, let them know how much you are excited to get to know them and get to know them, okay? Uh, it's hard being new around a church, and so you guys know each other if you've been doing church together for a long time. And so have them over for dinner, invite them out, and get to know this great family uh, and I'm sure not only would they appreciate it, uh, but you'll be grateful for getting to know them as well. Marcus, where are you guys at? Y'all come on forward. Marcus and Linda. We have an exciting announcement to share with you, and you heard this on Wednesday night if you were here for ministry reports, although most of you were not here for ministry reports, if we're honest, on Wednesday night. Um, but on Wednesday night, we and... Well, you're grateful that they weren't here? Okay. Okay. <laughs> Um, but uh, on Wednesday night, we announced to the church that Marcus is coming on church staff as our new minister to senior adults. So will you welcome Marcus to church leadership here? Amen. Amen. Wow. I'm not going to say this wasn't the case, but if your wife wasn't here with you, I don't know if they would have stood and I clapped. I, 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 I don't know. But we are grateful to have Marcus on, on board. He's all, I mean, these guys are already so uh, serving in such, great, in such high levels in the church and in influencers in this church, and so looking forward to how the Lord shepherds um, our senior adults uh, through you, Marcus. So thanks so much, and welcome to the team. All right. Y'all let him know you appreciate him. Susan is not here today, but she just celebrated her 22nd anniversary serving at the church. So the next time you see her, give her a hug and tell her how much you appreciate all that she does for us here around the church. Because when Susan is not here, 
Things don't work, okay? And so I'm so grateful to have her in my life, and so she is a blessing to us. And then finally, um, three of us leave for Guatemala next Sunday morning. So Alfonso, you want to come on down, and um, we are going to be commissioned. Keith, I'm going to ask you to do our closing prayer. Where are you at? I'm going to ask you to do our closing prayer. And would you just pray over this Guatemala team, which will be Wally, myself, and Alfonso. We leave on Sunday. We'll be gone for about six days leading a pastor's conference and doing some training down in Guatemala with relationships that the church already has that Wally has set up for us. So we're so looking forward uh, to this. We'll be sending reports back and pictures on social media and all that good stuff. Uh, But just praying for a fruitful time away. Uh, When we say amen, you are dismissed. When we say amen, okay? Y'all are getting ahead of me back here. When we say amen, you're dismissed, but I love you, and uh, we'll see you next time. Go ahead and pray. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for all your many blessings. Thank you for this church. Thank you for this country. Thank you most of all for Jesus Christ. We'd ask you to be with these, these missionaries. They go and they represent us. Protect them, guide us, keep them safe, bring them back safe. We ask that you go with us this week, keep us safe, protect us and guide us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen.